My name is Lisa budzinski Izel, and I'm the Federalist Society's Vice President for our Lawyers' Chapters. It will be my distinct honor and privilege to introduce the first of our keynote speakers today, Judge Janice Rogers-Brown. Before I do that, I'd like to take a brief moment to promote the activities of the Federalist Society's Lawyers' Division. Our 100-plus volunteer-led lawyers' chapters in nearly every state around the country host about 500 programs and conferences each year. Through these challenging times, the dedication of our volunteers has enabled us to maintain a robust programmatic schedule. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our leaders for their commitment to the society. We encourage you to join our chapters at fedsoc.org. And we've missed seeing you this year at the Mayflower. Next year will be bigger and better than ever. Judge Janice Rogers Brown was born in Alabama, the daughter of a sharecropper in the era of the Jim Crow South. She was inspired to attend law school, having witnessed the successes of the voting and civil rights movements. She moved to California, graduating from the UCLA School of Law and California State University, Sacramento. She served several distinguished roles in state government before her appointment to the state appellate bench and then the California Supreme Court, where she served until her nomination and eventual confirmation to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. She served with great honor and distinction until her retirement from the bench in 2017. Judge Brown received the Bradley Prize in 2019. She served as a jurist in residence at Berkeley Law School and is on the board of trustees for the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. Throughout her career, the Constitution has remained at the center of Judge Brown's life. She vigorously defended the rule of law, limited government, and structural restraints to check governmental power during her time on the bench. And she remained steadfastly dedicated to these principles now through her writings and her speaking engagements. She is one of the strongest and most passionate defenders of civil and economic liberty. And she is a role model for a generation of young lawyers who have clerked for her and who have been inspired by her life story. We are so grateful she has joined us today for her remarks entitled, A Love Letter to the Late Great American Republic. Thank you, Lisa. And welcome to everyone who has joined us. I'm really honored to be here with you, even if it is only remotely. I'm going to do something that I don't usually do, which is I'm going to talk a little bit about me and my feelings. This speech is called A Love Letter to the Late Great American Republic. And I wrote it because I am a mad black woman. I mean that in both senses of the term. I am angry and recent events have made me a little crazy. My heart is filled with anguish because what Lincoln rightly identified as the last best hope of Earth is being carelessly kicked to the curb. 1970, 1984, 1989, years shift and blend in my head like the colors of a kaleidoscope. In 1970, Gil Scott Heron recorded a song that quickly became the anthem of the Black Power Movement, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. That same year, The Flip Wilson Show debuted. The show was wildly popular because, as Mel Watkins put it, Wilson had the talent to make blacks laugh without anger and whites laugh without guilt. One of Wilson's many comedic personas was one Reverend Leroy, who presided over the church of what's happening now. One of Reverend Leroy's favorite sayings, which he was fond of declaiming from his makeshift pulpit was, everybody knows a lie is as good as the truth if you can get somebody to believe it. We laughed. In those days, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's assertion that everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts, was uncontroversial. But fast forward half a century, and the church of what's happening now is no longer a joke. Reverend Leroy's observation seems prescient. 
Not only do people insist they are entitled to their own truth, such truth can contradict objective fact. Moreover, government now treats truth claims that contradict reality as enforceable civil rights. What was a punchline in 1970 is a principle in 2020. The explanations that have been marshaled to excuse the mayhem we are enduring has been insanity inducing. It is impossible not to think of the dystopian vision George Orwell conjured in his novel, 1984. Most people only remember the meme, Big Brother is watching. But Orwell's real focus was on the misuse and abuse of language and the potential for manipulation when words lose their meaning. Thus, he who controls the past controls the future. He who controls the present controls the past. I don't know how what has been happening affected you, but I found it distinctly disorienting. I felt like I had a bad case of whiplash. And contra Gil Scott Heron, the revolution rehearsing eerily similar sets of grievances was not only being televised, it was being featured on YouTube, captured on thousands of cell phones, and broadcast on Facebook Live. Something had gone terribly wrong. In Hong Kong, people resisting a brutal regime sing our national anthem. In America, men who have become millionaires playing a game take a knee to show their disrespect for it. While the people of Hong Kong are waving our national flag, our domestic terrorists, the democratic socialists, are burning it. Millions of people continue to migrate to America seeking the freedom its principles enshrine. Rampaging mobs rule the streets of America, looting, burning, and pillaging, demanding that those principles be disavowed. Evan Syed explains why the culture war is devolving into a civil war. One side shouts, make America great again, by rolling back socialist advances that have destroyed schools, hollowed out industry, and undermined freedoms. While the other argues that America is a disease and that only socialism is the cure. In recent months, a number of university presidents publicly acknowledged the persistence of structural racism on their campuses. Princeton's president has confessed, because such performative confessions are now required, that anti-black racism remains embedded in the university's operations. If they were seriously trying to solve real problems, they might admit actual discrimination against Asians. But the anti-racist rhetoric of Princeton and other elite schools is a lie. Ivy League administrators mendaciously pander to student protesters by issuing in Randall Kennedy's telling phrase, faux mea culpas, aimed at pacifying the woke mob. American universities certainly owe mea culpas, but they are offering them to the wrong people. They ought to apologize to the American Republic and the people who love it. There might not be a mob to placate if American universities had taken their role as the gatekeeper of serious academic work and objective pedagogy seriously. Instead of defending liberal universalism, the academy, administrators, and most faculty caved to the threats of another group of student protesters. What began as an attack on alleged institutional racism quickly morphed into an assault on the integrity of the academic enterprise and, in the fullness of time, the American creed. Of course, the treason of the intellectuals did not begin in 1968. As Julian Benda observed soon after the end of World War I, intellectuals abandoned their high calling. Once they had opposed the political passions of the multitude, According to Binda, thanks to the intellectuals, humanity did evil for 2,000 years, but honored good. This contradiction, he says, was an honor to the human species and formed the riff whereby civilization slipped into the world. Needless to say, once intellectuals decided to be in the business of organizing political hatreds, the recrudescence of, barbar of barbarism was inevitable. However, 
the mythology of Western oppression, of perpetual systemic racism on which the mobocracy relies to justify the socialist assault on America can be traced directly from the abandonment of academic standards in the late 60s through the rise of critical theorists in the 1990s. What Pluckrose and Lindsay describe as the postmodern turn in critical theory, a rejection of enlightenment values, particularly objective knowledge, universal truth, science, or evidence more broadly, as a method for obtaining objective knowledge, the power of reason, the ability to communicate straightforwardly via language, a universal human nature, and individualism pave the way for a poisonous subjectivism. What came to be known as social justice scholarship is not scholarship at all. It is activism by another name. Teaching is no longer about helping students to think for themselves. Teaching is deemed a political act, and the only acceptable politics is identity politics as defined by social justice and its theory. Now, tenured radicals can openly declare themselves to be activists and teach activism in courses that require students to accept the ideological basis of social justice as true. The civil rights movement sought justice for all, but social justice is not to be conflated with the justice claims of authentic civil rights. Indeed, applied postmodernism, activism, political correctness, and more recently, the cancel culture, arrived on the scene just as legal equality had largely been achieved, and anti-racist, feminist, and LGBT activism began to produce diminishing returns. Thus, ideological indoctrination has forcefully supplanted the search for truth, a result that has led to the closing and coddling of the American mind. When the black entrepreneur and commentator Camille Foster offered an impassioned defense of free speech at Rutgers, he was repeatedly interrupted by the audience chanting, Black Lives Matter. When Foster finally asked, do facts matter? His interlocutor responded, don't tell me about facts. I don't need no facts. In a similar vein, when students at Claremont objected to Heather McDonald speaking at the school, they wrote a letter asserting that, quote, white supremacy venerates the idea of objectivity as a means of silencing oppressed people. The letter continues, the idea that there is a single truth, the truth, is a construct of the Euro West. The idea that truth is an entity for which we must search is an attempt to silence oppressed people. The worrying thing, Douglas Murray says, is not that students regurgitate such things, it is that they have been taught them. Indeed, to return to Orwell's dystopian view, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. That is the intellectual framework which purportedly supports the woke revolution. Its most salient characteristic is mendacity. Now, instead of universities being the seed beds of virtue they should be, they have become the dunghills of desolate ideology. Those who crow up on that dunghill most loudly will be rewarded with prizes and praise and even invitations to share their wisdom. Ibram X. Kendi and Ta Nahisi Coates are among the most eloquent expositors of the latest assault on American values. Kendi won the National Book Award in 2016 for Stamped from the Beginning and will soon be only the second holder of the prestigious Andrew W. Mellon Professorship in the Humanities at Boston University. Ta Nahisi Coates, who authored two memoirs before the age of 40, received a MacArthur Genius Award after the publication of his first book. Kendi and Coates are among the most influential of a new crop of thinkers and writers who forcefully reject once sacrosanct ideas about tolerance, equality, open debate, and racial reconciliation. 
At the end of a recent presentation, Ibram Kendi, the new prophet of anti-racism, was asked what he thinks would be the Rosa Parks moment of our time. And he answered, uh, socialism. He may not have meant to be quite that candid, but his response explains a lot. According to Kendi, we must fight discrimination with discrimination, and anyone who disagrees is a racist. Well, I disagree. And I note the new anti-racists are virtually indistingu indistinguishable from the bigots of old, except that they are bolder and they have invented a more vicious, capacious, and unpredictable racism. America stands accused of systemic racism because anti-racists assume American politics, economics, and policing has been corrupted by racial prejudice. That prejudice explains the entire difference in socioeconomic status between blacks and others. Anyone not actively engaged in dismantling the status quo is a racist or at least a collaborator and therefore a legitimate target for attack. Mr. Kendi's careless heuristic is false and incoherent. Rosa Parks did not take that seat on a segregated Montgomery bus to usher in a new era of socialism. She would have been appalled at the thought. She meant to strike a blow against actual institutional racism. She was challenging an unjust law that denied her equal rights. Rosa Parks was seeking to be treated equally by the law. Mr. Kendi contends the goal of assimilation is racist. Racism is now less a description of actual conduct and more of a powerful disciplinary tool that can be used to bend others to the contours of the woke will. Kendi's aim is to broaden the privileges of those entitled to fling the word racist around and to extend its power to ever more marginal misdeeds. His new and improved racism rests just as firmly on unexamined and unproved assumptions as the old racism he abjures. In the racism of old, the political class sacrificed the dignity and aspirations of black people to guarantee their hold on power. Ordinary white folks aided and abetted the demoralization and humiliation of black people because it was one aspect of their hard scrabble life that made them feel like winners. No matter how limited their opportunities, how impoverished their circumstances, how inadequate the schooling offered their children, they could at least consider themselves better than bla the black men who, no matter how well educated, how hardworking, how well healed, had to step off the sidewalk rather than allow their shadow to fall on a member of the exalted white race. Now the woke elite jettison the doctrine of non-discrimination. Ibram Kendi and his ilk condemn all white people for the sin of slavery and the racism that was integral to it. Anti-racists also reject the very idea of government neutrality. To treat people with, quote, equality, neutrality, and respect, unquote, is not just insufficient, it is illegitimate, a racist obstruction. And yet, Kendi did not turn down the prizes and perks offered by the woke supremacists who happen to be white. Those who hate freedom always use the same basic ploy. Utopians, Ravel reminds us, are shrewd seducers. That they propose the opposite of what they are really aiming for. The tragedy is revolutionaries reproduce the very evils they said they would extirpate. Thus, those who proclaim themselves anti-fascists have presided over a reign of terror, burning, looting, desecrating, accosting people in restaurants, on the sidewalk, and even threatening them in their homes. And the anti-racists have whipped up a new and improved racism, racism 2.0, more virulent, more stifling and restrictive, than simple racial animus could ever be. Kendi is no exception to Ravel's damning observation. When I see racial disparities, he says, I see racism. 
and he has a radical cure for it. As Christopher Caldwell has observed, enforcing the principles of statistical parity as stringently as Kendi proposes would require levels of social engineering, thought control, and expropriation that would make Big Brother blush. Lest there be any doubt about his totalitarian proclivities, Kendi would establish an agency to aggressively investigate disparities and punish conscious and unconscious discrimination. The agency would also have a mandate to equalize wealth and power between black and white neighborhoods and their institutions. In his zeal to punish perpetrators for their imagined misdeeds, Kendi ignores a fundamental principle of statistical analysis. Correlation is not causation nor does he attempt to eliminate other plausible explanations. He ignores the possibility that additional facts, including misguided social visions of the 60s, might have played a role. According to Tom Sowell, anyone interested in evidence need only compare communities as they evolved in the first 100 years after slavery with black communities as they evolved in the first 50 years after the explosive growth of the welfare state. The welfare policies of the great society discouraged the formation of stable families by making poor men redundant. Such policies led to a predictable increase in out of wedlock births, fatherless homes, and all the pathologies associated with single parenthood, poverty, poor educational attainment, incarceration. Thus, Bob Woodson contends, by redefining the nuclear family as Eurocentric, demeaning the Christian faith, and normalizing generational welfare dependence, the social policies of the 60s did what racism couldn't have accomplished before. Similarly, while the anti-racist platform demands the destruction of the status quo generally, and labels as a collaborator anyone who is not enthusiastically engaged in its demolition, it ignores the educational status quo in the inner city. The egregious inadequacy of those schools has condemned generations of black children to virtual dimitude on the fringes of the knowledge economy. Neither the anti-racist nor their street auxiliaries, BLM and Antifa, have shown any interest in changing that status quo. And no wonder. The ink was barely dry on the Times infamous 1619 project when the teachers unions rushed to include it in the K through 12 curriculum. The woke mob's silence on the critical issue of educational parity makes it abundantly clear that their alleged concern for the oppressed is entirely phony. The BLM manifesto reads like a guidebook for the continuing immiseration of poor black people. In addition to destroying the traditional family, a task they arrive at about 60 years too late, BLM proposes to dismantle the juvenile justice system. It is unclear how the community will benefit from an innovation that will make it even more difficult for urban schools to maintain the level of order and discipline necessary to learning. Additionally, BLM opposes jail time for convicted criminals and supports no bail initiatives, which ensure that offenders, even those arrested for violent crimes, will not be held more than a few hours. And after unleashing this plague of criminal opportunists on defenseless communities of women and children, BLM would defund and dismantle urban police forces. It is highly unlikely that residents in urban neighborhoods favor this initiative. They know that in the absence of aggressive police intervention, the negative pathologies of the ghetto will increase exponentially. The suffering that would result from this ill-advised initiative will outweigh the harm inflicted by police confrontations that end violently. As some of these incidents admittedly are, no one thinks the treatment of George Floyd was justified. Neither the forces of law and order nor the American Republic are so incorrigibly unjust, racist, and in need of radical transformation 
as the distortions of digital media would suggest. In fact, multiple recent studies find no racial disparities in police use of deadly force. The odds of an unarmed black person being shot by police appear to approximate his chance of being struck by lightning. I know that's hard to believe because it seems that that's all we see. But significantly, BLM has no interest in reducing violence that cannot be used to indict the system. The organization is indifferent to the tragic toll exacted by black on black crime, to the young lives from toddlers to teeny boppers snuffed out by random gunfights and drive-bys, to the grief of mothers whose sons are victims of the culture of street violence. Those black lives don't matter, nor do the dreams and hopes of black entrepreneurs whose businesses are destroyed, even though that's their life's work. Ta Nahisi Coates claims that he wrote his book, Between the World and Me, in part to console his 15-year-old son, who wept when he learned that the killers of Michael Brown would go free. You may not remember the name Michael Brown, but you will undoubtedly remember the Ferguson effect. The firestorm that erupted over the fatal shooting of the 18-year-old by a policeman in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014 is still playing out. Although indignant crowds miming the hands up, don't shoot narrative that emerged from this incident dominated the news cycle for many months, the charge that the officer shot Michael Brown in cold blood as he stood with his hands up trying to surrender has been shown to be a complete fabrication. In a well-researched book, Heather McDonald concludes the evidence eviscerated virtually every aspect of the pro-Brown anti-officer narrative. That was also the conclusion of Eric Holder's DOJ after a nine-month investigation. So when his son wept over Officer Wilson's acquittal, Ta Nahisi Coates might have taken advantage of the teachable moment to talk about the rule of law. He might have explained what equality under law means, the importance of facts to a legal determination of blameworthiness. Instead, he pinned a screed accusing his country of cosmic, unrelenting, irredeemable injustice. He told his son, the American criminal justice system exists to destroy black bodies. He calls the police destroyers and says, the destroyers are merely men enforcing the whims of our country, correctly interpreting its heritage and legacy. When he sees first responders rushing into the doomed buildings on 9-11, Coates writes that the firemen were not human to him, quote, Black, white, or whatever, they were the menaces of nature. They were the fire. Like Kendi, Coates gives the game away early in his narrative when he insists that American exceptionalism precludes any imperfection. If America believes itself to be the greatest and noblest nation ever to exist, it cannot plead mortal error. Thus, Coates says he proposes to subject America to an exceptional moral standard. And indeed, this turns out to be the stance of most social justice warriors, the pinnacle from which they condemn the whole of America's legacy. The woke cannot love America because it is not perfect. That exceptional moral standard apparently does not apply to the anti-racist regime that he favors or to Coates himself or to the scholarship that supports the woke supremacist indictment. That scholarship always contains a large measure of falsehood, hyperbole, and distortion in addition to egregious statistical errors. Falsifying history to serve a political agenda has a name. It's called propaganda. In his congressional testimony favoring reparations, Coates relied on unambiguously false economic data contained in a book authored by a historian 
who is part of the, quote, New History of Capitalism School of Historiography. NHC, as it's called, aggressively promotes the thesis that free market capitalism and slavery are inextricably linked. They do that in order to buttress the argument that only by abandoning the free market and embracing political redistribution will we ever atone for this tainted inheritance. In other words, the answer is uh, socialism. These historians would like to show slavery as the very essence of capitalism, but the truth is just the opposite. Unfortunately for their thesis, George Fitzhugh, the leading pro-slavery theorist prior to the Civil War, argued in 1854 that the tenets of free market capitalism were at war with all kinds of slavery, for they in fact assert that individuals and peoples prosper most when they are governed least. NHC's approach seems doubly ironic. They are arguing, one, atonement for slavery requires repudiating the very free market doctrines Fitzhugh identified as the greatest danger to slavery itself. But two, they are trying to show that socialism is the obvious answer to the wickedness of capitalism when socialism is not merely tied to slavery by the kinds of tenuous threads of dubious revisionist historical claims that they have found, socialism is slavery. To quote Fitzhugh again, slavery is a form and the very best form of socialism. There is not much difference between the slavery of the plantation and the slavery of the gulag, except that the latter denies the right of even the mind to be free. Tocqueville recognized this reality when he spoke out against the revolutionary fervor of 1848, the first broadly socialist revolution in Europe, warning that socialism challenged civil civilization's very foundation and was nothing less than a new road to servitude because it makes the state the sole owner of property, unleashes man's crudest material passions, and shows a deep distrust of liberty, of human reason, a profound scorn for the individual in his own right. The philosophical essence of the whole intellectual movement of the last century has been the concept of control, of power, as surely in collectivist liberalism as in Marxism. For the project to succeed, human beings must cease to be independent centers of free will and become either cells in a social organism or an inchoate collection of atoms. Then the political power of the state can be used to direct them. Now that we are well acquainted with the woke supremacist street auxiliaries, BLM and Antifa, it is clear they are not well-meaning people who have just gone a bit too far. Woke supremacists present an existential threat. They want to destroy America. They are serious about it. When the Louisville grand jury announced that no officer would be charged with murder in the Breonna Taylor incident, mobs rampaged through the streets, breaking windows, setting fires, and chanting, no justice, no peace. They might more accurately have chanted, no mob rule, no peace. To the mob, neither the facts, the evidence, nor the rules governing criminal responsibility mattered. In their view, when a black person dies in a violent confrontation with police, a murder charge must follow. If you are thinking, this sounds a lot like the bad old days we thought we had left behind, you may have a point. There was another time when the facts of a dispute were deemed irrelevant. Whose testimony was to be believed, whose guilt or innocence was to be determined, depended not on facts and evidence, not on the requirements of the law, rather it depended on the identity of the litigants. When Atticus Finch proved Tom Robinson's innocence in To Kill a Mockingbird, the facts did not matter. Tom was guilty because Mayella Yule said he was. 
and the testimony of any white woman automatically prevailed over any facts that could be adduced to demonstrate the innocence of a black man. So the lynch mob decreed, and so the jury confirmed. A generation of lawyers influenced by that story wanted to make amends by bravely defending the rule of law and its equal application to all people. But now the rule of law, like truth and objective facts, like freedom of expression and diversity of thought, are all proof of racism, all just aspects we are told of white supremacy intended to silence oppressed people. Social justice has always seemed a suspect verbal formulation. Why does justice need a modifier? Now we know. Social justice and mob rule are synonyms. I saw a man, a big man, with skin as rich and dark as black coffee. A policeman standing at attention on a Louisville street where he was swarmed by a horde of Lilliputians. The BLM Antifa mob cavorted around him, mocking and jeering. They made their fingers into guns and mimed shooting him in the head. There were white men and black men in the mob. One of the black men had painted his face white like a cannibal in an old Tarzan movie. Their remarkably inventive racial invective was punctuated with militant middle finger salutes aimed at his face. He didn't blink, he didn't flinch. He looked beyond them, his face impassive, his far-seeing gaze perhaps fixed on that mirage, that ever-receding dream of equality he once thought his service might fulfill. Wasn't it just last year that we thought the inclusion of black officers in major urban police forces was a triumph of diversity? I didn't know any of those protesters but the mobocratic spirit constantly reappears. They were there in 1963 when the fire hoses were turned on school children in Birmingham. They were laughing and cheering, waving Confederate flags. In 1965, there was a mob on the far side of the Edmund Pettus Bridge urging deputies on horseback to ramp up the attack on marchers who had already been sub subdued by tear gas. In 1960, Ruby Bridges made that long walk to the door of a New Orleans elementary school, while the mob, held at bay by an escort of federal marshals, screamed racial epithets and tried to pelt her with eggs. For the media to pretend that what we have seen in the last year has been peaceful protests is a travesty. To compare Antifa and BLM operatives with the conscientious, courageous, nonviolent civil rights protesters of the early 60s is to demean the movement of which they were a part. To characterize the actions of Rosa Parks, Ruby Bridges, and Arthurine Lucy as a pre prelude to socialism is a stunning betrayal. In the 60s, peaceful protesters demonstrated against institutional racism in support of constitutional norms. In 2020, raging mobs took to the streets to support systemic racism in derogation of the rule of law. When Janice Kelsey, who was part of Birmingham's Children's Crusade in 1963, wrote about that experience, she entitled her memoir, I Woke Up This Morning With My Mind on Freedom. This line paraphrases a hymn that declared, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. And that itself is a paraphrase of a hymn about Jesus. Ms. Kelsey is very clear that what she and other marchers fought for is not what protesters seek today. She said, I wasn't after special rights or privileges for me or my people. I wasn't after a job or school admission quotas. I just wanted a chance to live my life as an American citizen. We fought to have this country act according to the truth of the Declaration of Independence, that all men and women, including men and women of color, were and are created equal and should have equal protection under the law of our land. There seems to me not a nickel's worth of difference between white supremacist, Islamist imperialist, and woke supremacist, and we should call them out. Bigotry is not purified just by changing the target. 
Just as we refuse to negotiate with international terrorists, we should refuse to make excuses for domestic terrorists. We cannot compromise with any system whose objective is our destruction. This is not just a difference of opinion. The question is whether the regime of freedom that was founded here can survive the relentless enmity of the slave mentality. The spirit of American liberty, a creed dedicated to limited government, free men, and free markets, represents the only anti-utopian tradition to survive in modern times. I love America. It is a good country that often rises to greatness, miraculous in its recognition of the essence of legitimate government. The courage and generosity of her people make her an exceptional nation. But I do not love America because it is perfect, just the opposite. I cherish this nation's perfect imperfections. Whenever a group or a political class promises perfection in government, beware. Oppression is battering at the door. I find it increasingly difficult to speak of and for America. Anguish for the loss of freedom's refuge. Its principles, its uniqueness, and its manifold virtues clogs my throat. I am reminded of a line from an old poem by an obscure poet who said, I had to put my eyes on a diet. My tears were gaining too much weight. Things look bleak. The dark wind blowing from the future carries a hint of frost, of finality, but no matter. The inevitability of entropy is no reason to despair. Knowing the battle never ends only means we must redefine winning. I commend to you Tolkien's notion of the old courage. It is a theory of courage that removes all easy hope, knowing that good is obtained at vast expense, while evil recuperates almost at will, is not enough to make a hero change sides. In a 1967 speech entitled, Where Do We Go From Here?, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, quote, let us be dissatisfied until that day when nobody will shout white power, when nobody will shout black power, but everyone will talk about God's power and human power. If that day ever comes, that is a plea to which I will gladly add my amens. I started by saying I am a mad black woman. I am, but it may be more important that I am an old black woman. It means that I have experienced and forgotten more actual injustice, discrimination, and oppression than this herd of motley mandarins will ever encounter in their pampered little lives. So this is my view of what the cure is. We must speak the truth and defend the truth. Part of the truth is that individual acts of bigotry and racial animus will continue. But systemic racism is now the purview of the woke and the misnamed anti-racist. While they babble endlessly about perfection and purity, what they promote is a vile, toxic remix of the prejudice, bigotry, superstition, and hatred we have struggled to overcome. William Carney, an ex-slave who escaped to freedom via the Underground Railroad, received a Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions at the Battle of Fort Wagner in 1863. When the color guard fell, Carney, a member of the Massachusetts 54th Regiment, grabbed Old Glory and despite being shot five times, brought the flag back to the Yankee lines, declaring to his fellow soldiers, boys, I only did my duty. The old flag never touched the ground. Like him, I will cast my lot with the Constitution of Liberty, with a regime that has tried to instantiate the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. I will hold up the banner of freedom as long as I am able to my last breath. And when it falls from my grip, I pray there will be eager hands to catch it 
and never let it touch the ground. I would like to thank Judge Brown for her remarks. We deeply appreciate her virtually joining us all tonight. As a reminder, please tune back in at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific for our second address of the evening, delivered by United States Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito. Once again, we'll be live streaming the address through fedsoc.org. Thank you and have a great evening. Mm -hmm.